Hope may be the only strategy we have as markets struggle to hold on to gains despite rising jobless numbers and mixed earnings. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, former Treasury Secretary and Special Contributor Larry Summers. Former Commerce Secretary and Biden Advisor Penny Pritzker. If you think about commercial real estate, what do we do? We house the economy. And so to have a strong economy is what will actually drive value. Katie Koch of Goldman Sachs. Bob Michael of JP Morgan. Thinking of the bond markets as a traditional equity hedge or risk hedge just isn't there. Marianne Tai of CBRE. If you're in New York City or any one of the major gateway cities, you don't come to work there so that you can work from your apartment. And contributor Afsani Beshloss, CEO of Rock Creek Group. It was hard to know which way to turn this week as we got some encouraging news about possible vaccines and hopes grew for a fourth major round of economic stimulus. We can't play politics as usual here. And if we do that, I think we can get something done even by the end of next week if we put our minds to it. If not, uh, let's do the unemployment insurance piece and then let's come back and do the rest. But then again, jobless claims rose for the first time since March. Earnings were mixed. And President Trump himself admitted that the worst was yet to come with the pandemic. It will probably, unfortunately, get worse before it gets better. Something I don't like saying about things, but that's the way it is. All this left equities poised between risk on and risk off and switching back and forth day by day between tech stocks and cyclicals, while bonds remain firmly anchored by an indulgent Fed. And to and to take us through the equity side of that equation, we welcome now back to Wall Street Week, Katie Koch. She's at Goldman Sachs, where she is global co-head of Fundamental Equity Fund. So, Katie, great to have you back with us. Take us through this week, because it was wild. We forget that at the beginning of the week, we had the Nasdaq going crazy. Tech was really big. Then tech sold off, went to sickles. End of the week, sort yeah. of risk off. What's going on? Yeah, so it's been a crazy week and really also quite a year in, in, in equity markets. Um, you, when you look at the, the numbers year to date, markets are actually only up a half a percent, the, the S&P 500. But of course, under that, we've got the median stock down 19 percent, the FANGs, which you alluded to, up 35 percent, the other 495 stocks down 5 percent, and growth in value at this record spread of 30 percent, al although that's narrowing. Um, what I a couple of points I, I, I want to make here is is that I, we do need some things to support equity markets at these levels because valuations are quite expensive. They're at a 22 times 12 month forward price to earnings, which is in its 95th percentile most expensive. Um, and so we need to see the, the, the fiscal support that you alluded to and continued monetary support. And then from an earnings perspective, the expectations are low, but we're gonna need these companies to come out and, and beat those low, low expectations. So earnings are definitely something to watch um, for, for the rest of the month and, and, and the rest of the summer. So, Katie, we're in sort of in the middle of the earnings season right now. What have we learned so far? Because some people certainly have beaten those lower expectations. Other people have disappointed. Yeah, that's right. And so let's just define low expectations because they are quite low. Um, expectations were for a 43% year over year decline. That's the lowest that we would have um, since 2008 in the fourth quarter where we had a 70% year over year decline. So again, expectations starting low. Um, the current state of things is we've had about 25% of the US market report in terms of number of companies, about 30% in terms of market cap. 80% of those companies have actually uh, outperformed or they've surprised on the upside. Uh, three, if I if I could, David, maybe I'll pull out three quick trends that we're seeing across all of this. Um, the first trend I would say is that is this growth value dynamic. So you have these tech companies that have very elevated expectations, and they're actually coming in a little light, and that's causing many of them to to sell off. And then on the other side, um, you're actually having some of these cyclical companies, industrials, beating some of those low expectations and getting a lift from the market, and that's caused the growth value dynamic to to really narrow by about seven or eight percent over the last couple of weeks. Uh, second dynamic I'd, I'd I'd point out really quickly is that we are not seeing typical recession 
recessionary behavior. Uh, and a great example of that would be home builders. Usually in a recession, people delay buying homes. Um, but Lennar, a U.S. home builder, came out with a 9% increase year over year on profits. Now, why is that happening? Because in the COVID recession, we have these record low rates translating into record low 30-year fixed rates. We have a lot of people trying to move from um, urban centers to the suburbs. Um, and that has caused pent-up demand to be realized and, and home building stocks going up in a recession, which is very unusual. Um, and then the, the third point I want to make is how important it is to be specific company by company. Even in very narrow parts of the market, we're getting a lot of differentiation. So I'll end briefly on, on restaurants. We've liked restaurants because we know millennials like experiences over things for a while. And in particular, we like restaurants that are affordable, convenient through digitalization and delivery. So you've got a company like Domino's, 75% is done um, through digital delivery. Um, and they've actually uh, reported same store sales up 16% year over year, stocks up 30%. On the other side of the spectrum, in the same category of restaurants, you have uh, something like Darden, um, which owns a bunch of brands where it's more likely for one to do dine-in rather than delivery. Um, and they're showing same store sales down 40% and the stock's off 30%. So it just gives you a sense of even within sectors, you have to really discriminate across these business models. So Katie, a lot of us have been pretty absorbed with what's going on in the United States this week, but there was this little event at the beginning of the week over in Europe where they got yeah. together on a massive fiscal package, surprised everyone. Does that make you more optimistic about Europe? I, this is great news for Europe. It really is. It's a $750 billion rescue package for Europe. Uh, the first time that the, all of the EU member states have come together collectively and issued debt. This has very big impact longer term uh, for how they can they can cooperate together. Um, super bullish for the long term cohesiveness of Europe, which we'll all remember has been at question at times over the years. Um, also very bullish for European assets, uh, bonds, the euro, and uh, European equity markets. And, and just taking a step step back when we when we look at, at European equity markets, um, we, we do selectively like parts of that market. Let's call out a few things. The first is that the European recovery is, is well on its way. They were very uh, strict on the lockdown, but they're doing better on, on the recovery. Uh, PMIs were released this week, uh, 55 for the euro area. Um, it was 48 in June, so we're, we're seeing signs of that expansion. Uh, second point I would make for equity markets in Europe is valuations are at a 22% discount to the U.S., despite that better growth trajectory. Um, and so that's obviously compelling. And then the third point I want to make is Europe's leadership on green technology. That's about a third of that $750 billion rescue package is going to be pointed to a green recovery. Um, Europe is going to be a leader in sustainability. And so while the U.S. is going to continue to dominate, in our view, uh, traditional tech and biotech, Europe has a real chance to lead here on the green technology front. Um, and we like companies in that space. So an example of that would be uh, Neste, which is, one, which is the global leader. They have 65% of the renewable fuel market. Uh, Europe has committed to being carbon neutral by 2050. They're going to be a big winner in that. And in fact, they came out with this or, or their earnings this week, uh, EBIT up 30%, stock up um, itself uh, it, uh, about 15 20%. Um, and so that's pretty good for, uh, for, for an energy company in, in, in 2020. Katie, okay, just to wrap up this survey, China. There were some developments with China and U.S.-Chinese relations. Did the markets pay any attention to that at all? Mm, it's hard to tell because there's so much going on. But I'll, I, I mean, obviously, we had a, a lot of volatility this week. And so I think some of that tension was, was baked into the volatility. And, you know, this is a serious issue. This is the world's second largest economy. And it would be good for the U.S. to have a, a constructive relationship, the, the business community, with the world's second largest economy, particularly when we're in the midst of a recession. Um, but I will say that our CEOs are are expressing some pessimism on this relationship, regardless of, of who wins the White House. And I, I think this is something we all need to watch um, over, over the coming months and, and certainly hope that both of these superpowers can get onto um, a, a trajectory of a, of a constructive relationship, which would obviously benefit the, the both economies and, and, and both countries. So we can hope for that, um, right. but clearly the signs this week were, were disappointed on that front. Yeah, really important point about no matter who's in the White House, because basically right now, Democrats and Republicans both agree on one thing. They don't like China very much. <laughs> they, we, they, we do have agreement on that point. That's, uh, that, that's the one thing for sure. Yeah. So we have to be careful where we look for our bipartisanship, and indeed, because we're yeah. going to have to be dealing with China for some time to come. As Katie says, they're the two largest economies in the world. They have to deal with each other somehow, right, Katie? 
That, that's right. Um, and I, I would say just end, end it by saying that I do think emerging markets still is a, a good place for, for clients to look for growth and diversification yeah. out, outside of the U.S. Um, and so that should certainly be, be part of people's portfolio, but they need to be aware of that risk, which is going to impact both the U.S. as, as well as China and, right. and the emerging markets. Okay. Terrific, Katie. Thank you so much. That was really terrific. Survey of equities in this rather remarkable week. This is Carrie Koch. She's at Goldman Sachs, where she's global co-head of Fundamental Equity Funds. Coming up, we hear from the debt side of their ledger with Bob Michael, head of global fixed income for J.P. Morgan Asset Management. There is no way we in the bond market could absorb the trillions of dollars of issuance that would come out of federal governments globally. So I always have been saying that we're co-investing with the central banks. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. It wasn't easy being a bond trader this week, especially in treasuries, where yields barely budged no matter what was going on in the markets or in the world. The question is, does that tell us something about the economy or about the Fed? Something we asked Bob Michael, he's chief investment officer and head of global fixed income for J.P. Morgan Asset Management. I think the question is, why are we here? And it's because we've never seen the central banks take such control of the bond markets as we're seeing today. Of course, by setting uh, the Fed funds rate, the Fed controls the front end of the market. But QE, they can control all the way out the curve. With the ECB, they're buying investment-grade credit. The Fed is also buying securitized assets and uh, some crossover um, high-yield security. So. Yields are anything the central banks want them to be. Well, it's fascinating, Bob. I understand why you would, as a bond investor, be happy with boring. You like it nice and safe. At the same time, sometimes we like to look at the bond market as an indicator of where the economy is. Have we lost that indicator? Because as you suggest, maybe the Fed is really determining where the yields are at this point. For example, we have a significant negative real yield right now on the U.S. 10-year. Uh, is that really telling us nothing very much at all about the economy, but rather about the Fed? Well, it, it's telling us a number of things. One, it, it's telling us that uh, through financial repression, uh, the, the Fed is bringing uh, government bond yields down to a negative real yield basis to make the cost of the recovery affordable for the federal government. So I think that's clear. It's also telling us that investors, by and large, aren't fighting that, that we're expecting a period of very low inflation, if not disinflation. There's a lot of spare capacity in the system. And when you look at the mountain of debt that's being created across all levels of government, across businesses, and across households, that's an enormous headwind to inflation going forward. Uh, Bob, as a bond investor, you still want yield. Where do you look right now for yield, given the fact that they are so low? Well, right now, there are a lot of investors that are concerned about some of the credit markets because... There's a lot of borrowing that's gone into things like cruise lines, airlines, hotels, amusement parks, theater operators, retailers, stuff like that. And there are some expectations that defaults, if things get worse, could peak at around 10 percent. The other way to look at it is 90 percent of the high yield market won't default. And when you include in the investment grade bond market, you come out with something like default rates across all the corporate borrowing that's occurring, somewhere around 1 to 2 percent. So there's a lot to dig through. The reality is there are 330 million people in the U.S. They're generating some sort of spending, some sort of economy. A lot of it is going into TMT, entertainment. Uh, so those are the things that you have to roll up your sleeves and look for. Try to find the value. Uh, Bob, to what extent is the bond market really sensitive to what's going on with COVID-19? We thought uh, a couple of weeks ago that maybe we're getting on top of it. Now it seems to be coming back in several of the states across the country. Do bond yields reflect that to any degree? I don't think yet. I think we're getting pretty close to the point where that could be the case. And that could bring we the 10-year Treasury yield down substantially lower. We talked about how it's just fallen through six-tenths of a percent been pretty rock steady there. It could have from where it is if there's a real risk off environment 
uh, during August. So I, I don't think right now the bond market is all that worried about COVID-19, and, and I think we've seen the infection rate sort of flatten out, uh, but, but the potential is there for much lower government bond yields. Bob, what's, what's left of the 60-40 sort of investment? <laughs> that is to say, you really hedge your equity investments with some bonds. If the Fed is really sitting on, if I can put it that way, the yield on, on the bonds, is that still a reasonable hedge against the equities, which have been pushing up pretty significantly? That's a really good question, David. It's the one clients have been asking us nonstop over the last couple of weeks. When I've thought traditionally about uh, the bond market, I've always thought it should protect against a 10 percent decline in equity prices. Uh, so it should go up around 10 percent, which means if you look at the Bloomberg aggregate bond index, it needs to fall 150 basis points roughly. Well, the yield on that index is 120 basis points. So that's not in the card. So I think thinking of the bond market as a traditional equity hedge or risk hedge just isn't there. I think what you're looking at is a higher yielding liquidity market, higher yielding money market, so to speak. And yet at the same time, Bob, as we look at really remarkable issuance from governments around the world, but certainly the United States government, there seems to be no end to the appetite for it. What is driving that appetite, given that the yields are so low? Well, the, the primary driver, of course, are the central bank balance sheets themselves. There's no way we in the bond market could absorb the trillions of dollars of issuance that would come out of federal governments globally. So. I always have been saying that we're co-investing with the central banks uh, at this point in the cycle, and I think that continues. There is some appetite uh, to de-risk a bit, so cash in some equity holdings and risk holdings by plan sponsors that have long-term liabilities to meet, so they're doing some of that. We see bits and pieces of that, uh, but it's mostly just co-investing with the central banks is absorbing a lot of the supply here. That was Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan. Coming up, Penny Pritzker is helping former Vice President Biden put together his economic plan, a plan we got to see another plank of this week. It's a mix of programs that will be able to pay for this. It's absolutely doable. These are not outrageous numbers. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This plan is aimed at reducing the growth in government spending and taxing, reforming and eliminating regulations which are unnecessary and unproductive or counterproductive, and encouraging a consistent monetary policy aimed at maintaining the value of the currency. If enacted in full, this program can help America create 13 million new jobs, nearly 3 million more than we would have without these measures. That was President Ronald Reagan in February of 1981 outlining his economic plan, one based on cutting taxes and cutting government spending. Former Vice President Joe Biden has a very different approach, one based on increasing government spending and increasing taxation, including a plan to spend $775 billion on child care and taking care of the elderly, one that he would pay for in part by increasing taxes on commercial real estate transactions. We talked about the plan with a Biden campaign advisor, Penny Pritzker, former Secretary of Commerce. The most important thing in commercial real estate is to have a sound economy. If you think about commercial real estate, what do we do? We house the economy. And so to have a strong economy is what will actually drive value within the real estate market. The fact that we have a very weak economy, we have huge unemployment, we have great uncertainty, that's the problem for, uh, for the commercial real estate business, not you know, particular proposals by Joe Biden. Uh, do you anticipate with your uh, friends and colleagues who invest in commercial real estate that they will buy that or are they going to resist this? Look, every special interest has their own, you know, focus, if you will. But that's not the point. This is the time when the country needs to come together and recognize we have to build a better economy for our country, one that's durable and sustainable, one that works for all Americans. And folks in commercial real estate, folks in uh, business, folks in 
uh, leadership around our country recognize that that's essential. We can no longer live with this kind of massive disparity that we have. We can no longer have a situation where our health care doesn't take care of every American. We can no longer have a situation where Americans have no idea how they're going to be able to go to work or to get an education or to be prepared for the jobs of the future. I mean, that's the other thing that Joe Biden's very focused on, is helping Americans be prepared for today's jobs and jobs of the future. And you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks in terms of upskilling and something that I'm very focused on, which is making sure that we have the kind of training that we need in, in this country to be competitive. That's more important than any particular you know, uh, a modification in a specific tax policy. Even apart from t tax policy, as I say, commercial real estate is under some stress right now because of the pandemic. Whether it's office towers or whether it's malls, we're really having some big questions. From your experience uh, in this area, commercial real estate, what kind of long-term changes do you think we're going to be seeing in that, in that market? Well, what I'm hearing is that, um, you know, companies are rethinking what they're going to need in terms of their office real estate uh, footprint. They're recognizing that they can uh, do more work from home. We've all learned to become much more technologically savvy. That doesn't mean it's to the exclusion of having offices, but I think you're going to see shifts and see what I hear among my peers in the CEO community. They're thinking about what their workforce is telling them they want and need. Uh, and so I think you're going to see uh, uh, shifts in demand. I do think that uh, our center cities will remain places of great interest and, and great demand. Uh, I think once we can get back to a healthy uh, environment and a situation where we're not having to stay at home, uh, I think that you'll see a vibrant economy in our major cities and in our commercial real estate. As it relates to retail, you know, retail has been going through a change and the pandemic has uh, hastened that in terms of how much we rely on e-commerce. Uh, but this is something that, you know, one of the things that folks in commercial real estate learn to do is to adapt their properties. And I think you're going to see change coming. Vice President Biden is announcing the third plank of his economic program, the caring economy. It's very dramatic, I think, $775 billion for both elderly care and child care. Take us through it. What's very important about it? Well, I think what's important, let's step back for a minute. What Joe Biden will be is he will be a good jobs president, and he's going to provide greater certainty and stability in our economy, both domestically and internationally. And his proposal today is just one piece of that puzzle. He's really presented a build back better plan for America, recognizing that we have too much uh, income and wealth disparity in this country. Uh, at the same time, they don't come cheap. Any of these three planks have price tags attached to them. This one is $775 billion. How would that be paid for? Well, first of all, folks like myself are going to have to pay more in taxes. But, you know, the, the, there's also the ability to. Um, uh, you know, look at restructuring incentives so that folks can be able to take deductions, if you will, to be able to afford the kind of daycare or child care or elderly care that we're talking about. So it's a mix of programs that will be able to pay for this. It's absolutely doable. These are not outrageous numbers. These are completely within uh, the realm of possibility in terms of structuring our, uh, uh, our, both our tax and our revenue plans for our country. That was Penny Pritzker, founder of PSP Capital Partners. Coming up, we stay on the subject of commercial real estate in the time of the coronavirus with one of the major players in the New York market, Marianne Tai of CBRE. Each week, has been uh, different. We had a, a period of utter quiet. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Commercial real estate is feeling the pain from stay-at-home rules during the COVID-19 pandemic. Transactions fell 68% in the second quarter compared with 2019. That's according to Real Capital Analytics. 
many buyers that are expecting a discount, at least early on, are going to be disappointed. I think the prevailing trend in housing is that uh, many markets were literally shut down by government mandate at the state level and could not function. The pandemic made the retail slump even worse. Landlords were struggling even before COVID-19 as more consumers embraced e-commerce and large retailers went bankrupt. In retail, there's no doubt there was this trend that was going on and the trend was um, online and uh, that's gonna be accelerated, there's no doubt. Key shopping areas in Manhattan are getting hit hard. Lower Fifth Avenue had the biggest drop in retail asking rents in the second quarter, sliding 30% from a year earlier, according to a report by brokerage Cushman and Wakefield. It's not just retail that's feeling the pain. Office spaces are also under pressure. The pandemic has added momentum to a work from home trend that could be here to stay. I think you're gonna find that um, the, the old idea of a commuter going into New York City five days a week may be an idea that's behind us. Some New York City investment firms are embracing the shift by opening offices in Greenwich, Connecticut. The real estate market is very, very busy. I think you're gonna see a dynamic change. Let's face it, for the last uh, 20 years, young people wanted to be in the major metro centers. Now I think there'll be a little balancing out. Someone who keeps track of commercial real estate usage in New York day by day is Marianne Tai, CBRE CEO of the New York Tri-State Region. And she reports that we have a long way to go to recovery. We manage uh, over 30 million square feet in the Tri-State area and we can track, because people have to swipe in every morning, we track what we call unique swipes. So we have pretty precise numbers. I can tell you that only on one day since the pandemic began did we break 10% in New York City. Uh, this morning, for example, we were at 7% downtown and at 6% in Midtown. Interestingly, uh, our suburban market, however, has been hovering just under 30%. The thing I say about work from home, um, which you know has its own little acronym, um, uh, WFH, um, is that Depending on the geography, it may make a lot of sense. But the way I put it is if you're in New York City or any one of the major gateway cities, um, you don't come to work there so that you can work from your apartment. Let's start, let's start right there. Um, you come for, um, I, I, I joke all the time that the common denominator of big city dwellers and workers is FOMO, fear of missing out. They wanna be wherever the action is whether that's in the workplace, whether that's on the street, whether it's in the theater, wherever, wherever it is that they're working, they want to be part of that scene. And alas, that scene hasn't existed now for a number of months. So the, the interconnectivity of the, of the life of cities, the fact that restaurants and bars and movie theaters, et cetera, et cetera, all matter, I think is something that we're coming to appreciate in a new way. Um, now, I can tell you that um, we've been evolving as um, a, uh, in terms of, of office working, um, uh, office workers, we've been evolving to a place where there are lots of different options. So Marianne, just give me a sense of what's going on in the commercial real estate market right now. Are there deals being done? What's happening with prices or is it just frozen up until things sort themselves out? So uh, what's interesting is to watch each week has been uh, different. We had a, a period of utter quiet. And, and again, it's always an exaggeration in a, a very big world that we live in. Um, but we are now beginning to see uh, deals get signed up. And most of the deals, in fact, I would say the vast majority at this point, um, are what we call pre-COVID deals. So there were deals that were well on the way to happening and then people pushed the pause button and said, let's just wait and see what happens. I can tell you that um, on Monday morning, for example, uh, um, we saw in Manhattan over a million square feet of leases get signed, the bulk of them renewals, AIG renewing, Bank National de Paris, et cetera. And um, those were all deals uh, started uh, pre-COVID and those are both, those are both, but all of them actually, AIG has three deals, um, are long-term deals. So we are seeing that. I can tell you that there are retrades that happen at the last minute, as you would expect. Interestingly enough, most of the retrades have focused on free rent and they focused on give us more time 
um, without a rent start. And that's the form it's taken so far. We haven't seen, mm -hmm. we, we track, we're tracking every minute of this. And um, to date, yeah. in terms of the effective rent changes, that includes free rent, that includes concessions, right. cash to tenants, that includes the actual face right. rents. Um, the last number I saw, which was Friday, was 5.8% down. We expect it to be down more than that. But um, the market is, uh, the office using market, I want to be very clear, right. is slowly picking up. I should tell you, if you said to me, yeah. what is the preponderance of deals? And to me, this is extremely interesting. It's short-term right. renewals. One year, uh, three years, yeah. five years. I think something like 62% yeah. of the deals we've done in the recent, uh, 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 have been fallen to that category. That was Marianne Tai of CBRE. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our roundtable of contributors Larry Summers of Harvard and Afsani Beshlas of Rock Creek Group. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now for our virtual roundtable on Wall Street Week. And we're joined today by our two terrific contributors, Larry Summers of Harvard and Afsani Beshlas, who is the founder and CEO of Rock Creek Group. So, Afsani, let's start with you. You are a longer-term investor. You take a longer-term view. Historically, we've thought that a return for a pension plan, for a foundation, would be about 5%, a real return. In this day and age, given the risks we're looking at and the incredibly low yields, is that realistic or has that number got to come down a fair amount? Using the same risk factors as the past, I think it's going to be much harder to get that 5%, David. But I think what you're seeing is a lot of revisionist uh, sort of work right now where a lot of people are looking at the traditional 60-40 portfolios and seeing that those will definitely not get you the 5% return. And it's that 40% bond allocation, which is the big problem, of course, if rates stay at zero for a long time, as we all expect, uh, that then you have to take new kinds of risks. So one thing that you're seeing is people taking more credit risk in terms of uh, that bond uh, portfolio. And within equities, what you can do is start holding your companies longer. One model is the private equity model, but that almost is getting to be old. And a lot of people are looking at holding companies for a very long time, private or public companies, rather than churning them, because that reduces a lot of costs. And if a company is really good, why churn it? So what you're going to see is, I think, uh, really moving closer to maybe an 80-20. Some people are even talking about a 90-10 portfolio. And then within that, really making changes. The other thing that is happening is, of course, passive uh, equities right. and passive uh, bond portfolios and ETFs have become a large a part of big portfolios, pensions and uh, endowment foundations. And what you are going to see probably is that active is going to be coming in in a much bigger way. Just look at what happened with S&P 500. If you had invested in the top five, you'd be up more than 20%. And if you had invested in the other 495, you'll be down a couple of percentages. So passive investing may be going out in the way it was done in the past. And I think some form of a mix of passive and right. active might be there. So, so Larry, what is your take on this? I mean, what is a realistic, real return? And by the way, if we really do have to give up on essentially the 60-40 uh, hedge against equities going down because the yields are just not there for bonds, what does that do to the economy? David, I agree with what Afsani said, but I think I'd be a bit more pessimistic than uh, she is. Uh, I'd put it this way, relative to 20 years ago, Real yields on Treasury instruments are down three to four percentage points. That's kind of the base in the financial system. And then the question would be, what's happened to the risk premium that you can get by investing in stocks or by investing in risky companies? I'm not sure that risk premium has moved a lot one way or the other. On the one hand, uh, you could say that 
maybe that the risk premium has gone up. On the other hand, the fact that there are a lot more people who are happy to take a lot more risks, would other things equal tend to drive the risk premium down? It was much easier for sophisticated investors like Afsani, like the Harvard University uh, endowment, like some cutting edge pension funds, to find alternative managers in private equity or in hedge funds 20 years ago than it is today. Those spaces are crowded. So I would argue base safe rate down three, three percentage points or more. Risk premium probably hasn't changed a lot. Capacity to generate extraordinary returns through manager selection or through picking the best assets, that's probably diminished substantially as it's gotten more competitive. And so you add all that up, and I think institutions will be doing fine if they average inflation plus three over the next two decades. I don't think that's been internalized by the world of pensions. I don't think that's been internalized by the world of nonprofits. And as it comes to be internalized, I think it's going to be a pretty serious economic problem because they're going to feel a need to save more, and that's going to be a contractionary force bearing on uh, the uh, economy. I also think they're going to get driven into a riskier set of assets, and when they're in a riskier set of assets, that's going to be fine as long as things are good, but it's going to up the pressure for Fed bailouts when things get difficult. And that's not a game that can go on forever. So I think we're looking at a much more problematic long-term financial situation than is uh, generally supposed, with more risks of disappointment and more risks of increased risk-taking that leads in turn uh, to various kinds of problems and uh, crises. All right. Uh, Afsani, if you're an investor and you need to find some yield, what does that do about emerging markets as a practical matter? I'm very mindful of the fact the U.S. dollar has been down this week. We've got, as Larry alluded to, we've got the U.S., the, the real yield on the U.S. 10-year Treasury uh, in, well in the negative territory, which is driving people toward EM. Is that a reasonable alternative? You know, I think I agree with everything Larry said. I think uh, before I jump into emerging markets, I would say that the only other place where you can also find returns is not just your traditional talent, but finding new talent, because new talent is looking for different kinds of alpha in the market. And one of the things that we continuously do is find that, you know, sort of the next Sequoia or the next Andrews and Horowitz or the next Bapost or whatever. Uh, so in terms of talent, I think you can be on a quest uh, and find people who are looking for the best ideas, but obviously you can't do that if you are you know, looking for a huge amount of alpha. The other thing I think with emerging markets is that, uh, David, it's a tale of two cities. You know, um, Technically, China is emerging markets. Technically, a lot of North Asia is emerging markets. But if we look at the huge developments that they are making right in front of our eyes, you know, in terms of COVID, they're ahead in uh, dealing with tracing, dealing with uh, uh, testing, dealing with uh, distancing and all of the other things, which has allowed their economy to take um, a much faster route to normalcy compared to ours. Similarly, they have introduced uh, into their financial system much better tools in terms of fintech and can, for example, when the governments were trying to push money into the average, um, consumer, they could push it to people. In our case, look at how inconvenient and how not very good was the PPP in terms of getting to the end user of PPP, because it was being done through banks who did not necessarily help the smallest businesses in the US. So we are basically very positive when it comes to North Asia. And at the same time, when you look at emerging markets as a totality, what we're really worried about is places like Latin America, places like Africa that have made incredible development and where they have had very interesting markets could lose a lot of what they've basically uh, made in the last 20 years. And that could be a huge problem. 
I don't know what Larry thinks about emerging markets or whether he has a different view. Larry? I think Afsani uh, is enormously thoughtful on this, and so I hesitate to disagree with anything uh, she says. Um, I think it's a complicated story uh, in uh, China. I think given the vexed political relations between our two countries, um, any American investor in China and in Chinese companies has to think about uh, the fact that it may well be easier to move money in than to ultimately take money out uh, if uh, you have been uh, successful. So I think a substantial risk premium has to be attached uh, to investments in China for foreigners. And they may work out and they may be worth uh, that uh, risk premium. But I think anybody who thinks that that's easy money is making a very substantial uh, mistake. And I, I suspect Afsani uh, would agree with me yeah. that that's not a um, strategy for, uh, for amateurs. You know, Afsani yeah. talked about yeah. there are always new managers and there are always new frontiers. Yes, there are. I just think the supply of money looking for those new managers is pretty large yeah. relative to the flow of new talent with new ideas. And so I'd yeah. be surprised if that was going to work miracles for large pools. You know, it's like a shortstop batting 400. There are a lot of people after him. Thank you so much to Afsani Beshalas. She is the CEO and founder of Rock Creek Group. Coming up next, we're going to have a talk with Larry Summers about Washington, how the recovery is going, and what we should expect from Congress next week. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're back now with our contributor, Larry Summers. So, Larry, uh, give us your take on where the recovery is right now, and particularly what Congress should be looking at. They promised us we're going to have something maybe next week in terms of a fourth round of stimulus. What should they be doing, taking into account where the recovery is in deciding what to do? David, I, I can't remember a moment when a recovery has been more uncertain uh, than right now. Usually the economy hits bottom and you can be pretty confident that it's going to go up uh, for a while. But uh, this time, I don't think so, given what we're seeing in the data on unemployment insurance claims this week, and more broadly, given the uncertainty about the course of uh, the pandemic. We don't know how controlled uh, this is going to be. I said some time ago that we were going to be paying problematic whack-a-mole with this thing until we had a vaccine in place and well-established. That means a lot of uncertainty, and that could easily mean that uh, this recovery aborts much earlier and much quicker than uh, most uh, such missions uh, do. So I worry uh, a great deal about the biggest fall off in stimulus in uh, the country's uh, history mm -hmm. if Congress doesn't act strongly mm -hmm. and quickly. And I think that's a real uh, concern. And both right. scale and speed is what we need right now. Right. Larry, are we going to need it again in two months and four months and six months? I mean, can we have a true recovery without a vaccine? I don't think things are going to feel anything like normal until we have a widely distributed, widely trusted uh, vaccine. I think that some of the measures being discussed, a uh, big increase in state and local relief, for example, would last for more than a couple of months in their impact. I think a reformed employment insurance set of measures should be put in place with a horizon more like six to nine months than like uh, 
two to three months. I think everybody makes a mistake. They focus on the size of the package and they don't focus on the duration of the package. So they don't focus on the rate of flow of uh, stimulus. I think we need to scale stimulus back from the level that it was at the worst moments, but we need to maintain a very substantial fiscal impulse uh, in this economy for quite some number of uh, months uh, going forward. I personally doubt what I think is the market's view, which is that we're going to have most people vaccinated and life returning to normal sometime by spring of next year. I think that's a real possibility, but I don't think it's better than a 50 percent uh, chance, given all the difficulties of implementation, given the credibility problems and the issues that the government has shown in execution. I mean, let's face it, vaccinating the whole population with some vaccine that requires administration a couple of times that is being injected into people's bloodstream in a country where the president of the United States until a few months ago was an anti-vaxxer, getting that done is vastly harder than making sure that there's a face mask for every nurse or hospital orderly. And we are struggling with making sure that there's basic personal protective equipment. So whether we have the competence and organization at this point as a country to pull off a large scale vaccination program and have the government yeah. be trusted and have people do their part, yeah. I think is a real possibility, yeah. but is a long way right. from a certainty. Right. I'm afraid you may well be right, Larry. Thank you so much. That is our special contributor, Larry Summers, who, of course, was the Treasury Secretary. And he says it's more important how long the relief lasts rather than how big it is. Finally, one more thought. Maybe you really can't keep a good country down. It was 51 years ago this week that the nation celebrated one of its greatest accomplishments when three Apollo 11 astronauts returned safely to Earth on July 24 after traveling to the moon. And back then, things weren't going so well for the United States either. We saw um, you know, a, a war raging in Vietnam and protests in the streets and at the Capitol and, and at universities. We had civil rights abuses and civil rights protests. And in the midst of all of that, we were able to send Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the surface of the moon. And for that unique moment in time, everybody in the country united. Now, just over 50 years later, we once again have our fair share of adversity, with people marching in the streets, massive unemployment, and, oh yes, this time a pandemic. But if history doesn't repeat itself, Mark Twain teaches that it does sometimes rhyme. So maybe what we need this time is a 21st century equivalent of a moonshot. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.